Dear followers of the YouTube channel of Association for Community Mental Health Promotion, this is going to be our first uh, English posting in our uh, channel. Uh, we, we have uh, several YouTube uh, posts in Turkish, but this is our first one. Uh, my name is Bülent Coşkun, a psychiatrist retired from Kocaeli University Psychiatry Department, and I am the chair of the executive board of the Association for Community Mental Health Promotion. Uh, we had in mind to have online broadcasting, online streaming, but due to uh, financial limitations, we decided to have this uh, Zoom meeting among ourselves, then post it, and we will try our best to put uh, subtitles in Turkish. Now, uh, on behalf of our association, I want to thank uh, with my uh, deep, uh, sincere feelings uh, to uh, Dr. Sartorius, who has accepted to be with us today. Uh, I have, I don't, I want to call him a transgenerational master. Uh, he has uh, been uh, serving to improve mental health uh, for various generations. The first time I met him was 1987 uh, when I was working at the Ministry of Health as the director of mental health department. And he uh, came to Turkey uh, to guide us in improving mental health program, mental health development program. There, I uh, saw their relation with my professor Orhan Öztürk. They were friends. They were, uh, it was that uh, generation. He had some friendship, some impact on, or maybe had some impact. Then came uh, my generation in my mind. Uh, friends, we were uh, composing this, those activities. Uh, there was Levent with us, Bedirhan with us, Aishan with us, and many other colleagues. So it's, it became our generation's uh, teacher. At that time, we didn't use the word mentor, or maybe we, do, we were not aware of that concept, but he has been a mentor uh, officially for several people, I believe, but also a mentor for lots of people unofficially. And I consider myself being one of them. Anyway, and later my residents and my students in our university had also uh, found the opportunity to uh, get some information, get some uh, light from his uh, teaching. Uh, I don't know if you may call, remember, Elif was one of them, Elif Kırmızı Alsan. And uh, when you were with us in 2008, lots of medical students had the chance of listening to your vision. Uh, this is a perspective from Turkey, but I am sure this is not only for Turkey. Uh, you have been all around the uh, world, and I personally have also witnessed that during the six consecutive years uh, when I had attended World Health Assemblies, and each year you and uh, your great uh, colleague, friend, uh, Lera Sartorius, uh, you were so uh, nice to invite many people from all around the world every, at each year uh, in your home. Of course, I was attending one of them, but every day you had similar uh, guests from all around the world, I believe. And there I had very interest, interesting day, some uh, chat with Surgery General of United States. I couldn't even imagine uh, to have a chat with that lady. I can't remember her name and several other colleagues. Sorry, I, I instead of talking about your CV, uh, uh, because it would take more than hour, of course, hours, 
I wanted to have uh, my own perspective about our relations with you and uh, some examples from other places. I want to end this part by uh, underlining that uh, many people in Turkey or in the world know very well that uh, you are one of the best teachers in, in the field of psychiatry and you have uh, worked at the WHO, World Health Organization, as a director of mental health department, and also at WPA as the president of WPA during uh, 1996 or some of those years. And now you are active in as a council uh, still. I mean, I'm saying still because there has been so many years after your presidency uh, in the recent uh, WPA uh, Zoom uh, meeting, uh, you were uh, the star again. I mean, you are always uh, the master of intergenerational, transgenerational. I, I want to thank you really for being with us. Uh, after such a short speak, speaking, let me start, uh, ask my younger friends, and here is also a three generation, one dinosaur, two uh, similar uh, colleagues from similar ages, two psychiatrists and two students. Please, let's start with Miraj, with you. Uh, thank you, Hojam. Uh to giving me this opportunity to talk in a such uh, great uh, meeting. Uh, I'm really excited to talk there. Uh, and first, let me introduce myself. Uh, I'm Miraj, uh, and I'm a fifth year medical student uh, in Koç University in Istanbul. Uh, and I, I'm planning to uh, pursue a career in uh, child and adolescent psychiatry. And I'm participating in research projects that's going on on my university in psychiatry department. And uh, nowadays I've been working with uh, parents and individuals, uh, parents of individuals with autism spectrum disorder. And uh, yes, I think that's all from me. <laughs> For the time being, let's say, thank you. Yeah. May we go to Sumeye, please? Hello, uh, nice to meet you and thank you for the opportunity to meet you. Um, I can shortly introduce myself. My name is Sumeye Yaj. I'm a psychologist and family consult consultant. Uh, I am still a student, a master's student in Malta University at Body Oriented Clinical Psychology. I'm in my thesis phase and um, I worked for three years with children with autism spectrum disorder, ODD and uh, ADHD. Now I try to, to proceed my career with, adult, with adults. And um, thank you. <laughs> thank you. May we go to Jenon? We are going in the uh, age order. Is that the proper way? Yes. Hello. Uh, I would also like to thank you very much for being with us, Professor Sartorius. It's a really a great pleasure for an honor for us. And I'd also like to thank uh, Professor Joshkun for providing this opportunity to us. Uh, let me introduce myself. Uh, I am a psychiatrist in Ege University and also a lecturer. And my residency was between 2013 and 2017. And my dissertation was about uh, adapting cognitive behavioral therapy to internet. And uh, I've been a, a psychiatrist since 2017. Uh, now I'm still interested in this internet-based therapy program. And um, that's all for now, thank you. Thank you, Jenan. And yes, please, IBK. Uh, sound, yeah. Hi, I'm IBK Sen uh, from Bursa, Turkey. I'm uh, really glad to be here with you in this meeting. It's a big chance. Uh, thank you, Professor Sartorius and uh, Professor Joshkun to provide this. Um, I'm a psychiatrist for six years. Uh, I worked in the university with uh, Professor Joshkun 
uh, it was a chance for me too. Uh, and uh, now I'm a psychiatrist at a public hospital. And uh, it's a very easy hospital. And I have a chance to see uh, many patients. And I'm also interested in uh, digitalization effects uh, on mental health, especially. Uh, it's advantage and disadvantage. That's all for now. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. How do you think we should start? We have prepared some questions to ask you, but before, uh, would you like to say a few words uh, about my colleagues, my dear friends? I can't, we can't hear you. Delighted to have the opportunity to uh, to talk with you again. It's an old friendship, and it's always a pleasure to be with you, Bulent. Um, and uh, of course, also to meet your uh, colleagues. And it was, I think, uh, it's wonderful that we have representatives of groups uh, of people who are of uh, such importance in in programs of mental health, both students and psychologists and psychiatrists and. Uh, people who are interested in telemental health and people who are not interested in telemental health, but would like to do psychotherapy with humans. Um, so it's nice to have this wide variety and I'm sure that we'll have a, a very pleasant discussion. And I would also like to say that, um, you know, we have a sentence in our own language which says that the town is never built in a day. And so uh, maybe we can think about seeing this hour or whatever we have today as a beginning of a conversation that would continue on your YouTube and uh, uh, where we would grow together with the conversation. Great idea, as usual. Thank you. Then uh, may we start uh, sure. with Miraj uh, again in the same order we were planning to uh, have some pieces out of your wisdom. Please, Miraj, let's hear your question or your contribution. Uh, yes, as I said uh, before, I, I've been working uh, with uh, people with autism spectrum disorder. So that's my uh, tiny piece of uh, experience in psychiatry yet. And, but I want to uh, ask a more broader uh, uh, group like people with mental disabilities, I mean, including autism spectrum disorder, intellectual disability, and so on. Um, and when I uh, make interviews with uh, those people, I realize that in Turkey, we have still a lot to improve for their care. And I really want to do something for them. I really want to be part of this action. And I want to ask you, uh, what can we do uh, to promote their rights for mental health care. And also current restrictions due to pandemic uh, increase their burden. I, I see that when I uh, make some uh, uh, calls with them, they, they always mention that. So I really want to do something for them, but I don't know what's the best way to do in it. Is it uh, scientific research that uh, mentions their um, burden or is it being a part of non-governmental organizations and advocating their rights. I really want to ask you uh, that what can, what can I do as a future practitioner? Well, uh, you are a future practitioner, whether you will do psychiatry or will you do general health care? Uh, I, I think for a short term, I, I have to do a general practitioner um, a career, and then I, I planning to be a psychiatrist. Well, one of the tasks which psychiatrists have neglected in the past, which is a great pity, is uh, the very large possibilities for primary prevention of mental disorders. Uh, this uh, may, uh, if you look at the books, uh, the primary prevention is usually not mentioned. You are familiar with the difference between primary secondary, tertiary, and quarterly prevention. I'm talking about primary prevention that is preventing mental illness and problems. And I think that both as a general practitioner 
as, as a uh, doctor, there are a number of things that one can do uh, to prevent the occurrence of mental illness. And that may be for the future, one of the great tasks before us. Let me give you a few examples. Um, if you look at the number of, uh, if you look at women who come to uh, perinatal care because they are uh, seeking advice, <coughs> it would be, uh, if it were possible to provide all those women with iodine, it is probable that about four to six million cretins would never be born because that is the total number of women who are in fact pregnant, they do not get iodine and because of that, their child. Now, iodine is not expensive. In many countries, it has been introduced, but in others, it has not. And also women are very different in their diet and things. So a measure that can be done like that is, uh, um, would prevent a number of these. But I, there are other examples. Let me give you an, one that I think originally came from, uh, I'm not sure whether it's Turkey or Syria. I remember that at the time there was, uh, people were having the habit of sleeping on the, on the seal, on the, on top of the houses. And I also remember that uh, there was a certain number, quite a number of children who fell off the roof while sleeping and hit their head. And the greatest contribution that one could make to the prevention of head injury was to put a small fence on top of the buildings. And promoting a fence on top of the building would have been a promotion of a severe mental problem. I'll give you another example. We have a, a grandchild. Uh, she is a little girl. She's now grown a little bigger, but she is a girl who uh, did in school and then she had some little problems. Uh, and the teacher called my daughter, who uh, is the mother of that girl, he called the, uh, uh, my daughter and said, well, you know, we would like, it seems that your child has a dyslexia and that she should go and uh, we have to discuss uh, whether there is a particular psychologist or doctor who can uh, help her with dyslexia. And uh, my daughter said, fine, all right, well, uh, we will do something like that. Meanwhile, uh, the Christmas came and Christmas is a time when you always look what kind of gifts you might give to some child. <clears throat> and we decided, my wife and I, to give to that particular child, to give her um, a small microscope because she's very interested in this. But we saw after a few weeks that she was not interested in the microscope. Uh, and we said, why is this? We know that she was interested in these matters. And uh, so I thought maybe she should uh, go to see an ophthalmologist to see whether she sees well. And uh, they said, this is nonsense. Why should she go? There are two times a year in Swiss schools. There are two times a year a routine examination for eyesight of all children. And I, well, I said, let's go nevertheless. And so we sent her to the uh, ophthalmologist uh, who examined her properly and discovered that she has hypermetropia. And she has a hypermetropia of two and a half dioptries. So we put the glasses on her nose and she became the best in her class. No more dyslexia, it's gone. And that is in a country where uh, child eyesight is being tested very seriously, but not sufficiently seriously. Now, approximately, the estimate about 60 million children become dropouts from school. And about half of them become dropouts because of undiscovered visual or hearing deficit. If we could correct the visual deficit, we would reduce the number of school dropouts. And as you know, school dropouts are uh, uh, a very serious risk for a child to become uh, addicted to drugs and to go into crime and uh, various other things. The point which I'm making, and maybe it's too long, is that both as a general practitioner and as a psychiatrist, one of the important roles that we should play is to think of possibilities for primary prevention of mental disorders. Uh, this is uh, true in all countries of the world, and Turkey is no example, no exception from that rule. So that's one thing that I think you should do and can do already now. And as time goes by, 
one could think of ways of linking psychiatry closer to general health care and to education in order to discover possibilities for uh, uh, prevention and for care as well. Now, of course, one would at the same time want to produce epidemiological research to show how many cases are sick. But I think that we already have the figures which tell us how serious the disorder is. And not, it doesn't help very much with many governments. They don't listen. They say, well, we'll do it later. So that having figures is not the way to go. I think it's both our own activity and seeking ways of engaging other people in the prevention and treatment of mental disorders. And working in the, with children uh, and um, the uh, um, spectrum of Asperger and the similar spectrum of the autism, probably another thing that you could do is to think of ways in bringing two parents who seem to you to be the like in some way to bring them together. And then maybe have a third one who joined them. It is once uh, parents collaborate, they can very often resolve many problems and they learn from one another and they can help each other. Uh, let me, Dr. Choshkun, forgive me for this long answer. No, please, uh, please. There was a, a very pleasant lady who was called uh, Dupont and she was a psychiatrist working in Denmark and uh, she wanted to do something for, um, uh, she was very interested to see how it could be done to increase the uh, uh, quality of life of people who have children who have mental retardation or multiple handicaps or Asperger's syndrome. And uh, so she did a survey and the survey was a day, the time budget of women who are mothers. And she discovered that these women, because of care which they have to provide to their children, stopped going to cinema, stopped going out at all, never went to a hairdresser, stopped going to shops, uh, stopped having sex with their husbands, a whole range of tremendous limitations which these women had. So what she did, uh, she reported, and there is a, in the newspapers, what are the limitations of life that happens to these uh, ladies whose children are not well? And then she said, all right, now let's do something. Let's bring five parents together. And one of them will take care of the five children one morning. And the next one will do this next morning and so forth. And so each morning, these five children were together for what, two or three hours in the care of one of these women who were there. And then she measured again what happened to their life. And these women came to life again. They could go to a hairdresser. They could go and shop. They could speak to people. They could go out. They become human again. And I think that that's bringing people together uh, is this probably the most important thing in addition, of course, to treatment, which you can provide. Uh, th thank you, uh, Dr. Norman. It was a great idea uh, that you gave me. So I, I was just planning now for what can I do about this topic, bringing people together. I think that's the be best way to help those people. I, I I'm just uh, have this in my mind and thank you very much for your uh, great vision. Uh, just uh, mention about them and for your contribution for my work. Thank you for uh, your good question, Miraj. Of course, uh, it's. I I'm sure uh, these message of messages of Dr. Sartorius will uh, reach to our audience, uh, among which there will be students, medical students, or other uh, mental health uh, students. I mean, uh, other students working in mental health, the different disciplines of mental health and physicians and also the families. It's going to be open to uh, everyone. Uh, many thanks once more. May we go to uh, Sumeya, please? It's your turn. Yes, I would love to share my question. Um, hello again, Professor Sartorius. Um, I have a body-related question, actually. How I said I'm 
from a body related master program. And um, I just want to share first that uh, we had the chance to observe the anxiety level during the pandemic and the somatization level from that anxiety. Um, and we did some self reflections among us 30 students and uh, we saw that or we observed or we noticed that um, we there is a I will try to put it together there is um, an increase in somatization levels from anxiety um, by doing mindful activities so when a less embodied person a hypo embodied person uh, do some mindful activities like meditation um, the rate of somatization of somatization of that anxiety raises so um, we was we were shocked because those were actually our observations and our statements or self reflections and we we just hold our breath and we said okay everyone is in in a in an area in a in a phase right now in which uh, blind uh, suggestions for meditation and everything is made or yoga and um uh, can you elaborate what you mean by blind with blind i mean uh thoughtless suggestions so uh, okay you're not fine do meditation go and take a breath exercise or something so it is not in 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 professional hands it's just like a, a daily saying right now in turkey especially and um we just want to know or i i'm i'm, I'm serious about how can we prevent this blindness? So what can we do? Because it is, I know that you work with somatizations and uh, people who are not fully aware are just in a phase in which they have to rely on their body because the body is in threat. We are in a pandemic and uh, they show symptoms about their anxiety. So is there a way to prevent this? Or what can we do as healthcare professionals? As mental health care professionals? <laughs> to, prevent, uh, to prevent what? To prevent, is it a question for me? Yes, yes. Yes, to prevent this. Um, so, how can we limit this? This blind, what what uh, Professor Bulent just asked, uh, this blind suggestions about doing mindful activities. So, not under observation from a healthcare professional. Yeah. Well, you know the um, every culture has uh, invented ways of uh, dealing with problems. Mm -hmm. um, some have, uh, for example, in the Nordic countries, they feel that physical action is very useful, that you should go and exercise. In India, they have been thinking about meditation and about, in, generally in Asia, there was many who would say that meditation is very good. Uh, yoga, they have invented and they are doing yoga. The Far East has invented something. So in each culture, people have, uh, invented ways uh, which uh, have helped them uh, to overcome problems. But uh, a technique or a methodology translated from one place into another doesn't work always mm -hmm. because it is the culture as a whole which has to be uh, in harmony with the technique that you are proposing. So that it is probably true that uh, I do not know enough about Turkey, but I know that for some of the Central European countries, meditation is the last thing that people would have done previously. I mean, normally it is expected that if you have a problem, you go and resolve it. You don't sit at home and, uh, you know, put your legs up. That is yes. not what we are doing. We, we have to do it. Now, if you introduce people and you tell them, no, no, you should do meditation, it is extremely important to think who should receive that advice. And if you find that that is a person who by their personality structure and by their past are likely to benefit from that, then that is a good technique. So the argument is that there are numerous techniques that exist and all of them can be useful for some people. Practically none of them are useful for everybody, um, except maybe medications, uh, which are seem to be generally useful. So I think that if you want to prevent people from uh, um, um, from following blindly one or the other advice, one should really publicize what are all the options that exist and leave it somehow and not people tell them you must go and do meditation. But I think that it would be much better if the people could be 
educated about various techniques and various ways from physical exercise to going out for walks to uh, uh, writing. Some people are suddenly discover that they can write and they write everything down. Uh, there is a variety of techniques and one has to uh, work together with the patient uh, to discover what is the technique that is closest to the person's personality. Uh, this is a person who is more pensive. So let's try to give him meditation. This one is more active. We give him something like that. And I think that the blind application of the same technique to all people is probably going to result in poor results for many of them. Techniques are specific. There is, however, one thing which is very important, and I will speak about this in relation to medications, to psychiatric dog drugs. In the past, we have been talking about uh, having a, uh, a psychiatric medication, which is um, having an effect, and then there is a placebo effect that goes with it. So together, these two effects uh, make it. But as time went by, it became more and more obvious that in fact, in addition to the effect of the medication and the placebo effect, there is what is called the non-specific aspects of treatment. Mm -hmm. Now, the non-specific aspects of treatment are uh, including things such as the respect for the patient, such as in seeking a treatment method that is in harmony with the person's personality and things like this. And they make a huge, huge difference. Now, how do you stop somebody from giving the wrong advice? That's very difficult. And there I have no advice to do it. But the only way you can fight it is to become famous for giving better advice. <laughs> Great idea. <laughs> Hopefully. Thank you for your answer. Maybe uh, let me share what I have understood. Uh, instead of uh, advocating an idea, we as professionals maybe should do our best to promote awareness, critical thinking. And these of course should be at school or, or I should say, and at homes. If the parents are uh, wise enough to give different, uh, that uh, tell them, tell their children or tell the others that there are different options what I have understood from uh, Dr. Sartorius saying is that, and especially uh, the, the statement culture is a whole is really something which I uh, would like to underline. And none is good for everybody is another one. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, both of you. One bringing this issue, the other uh, sharing his wisdom. And uh, the, in, uh, in order, uh, we should go to maybe uh, Jenan, but may we go to IBK, uh, keeping in mind that she will have some question which might later be related with what Jenan has in his mind to ask. Can we do this small uh, shifting? Please, IBK. Yeah, sure. Thank you again. Uh, my first question uh, is answered. <laughs> so uh, I was going to ask uh, about um, he not healing, preventing mentally uh, ill. Uh, because, because in our daily practice, we uh, focus, especially mental health uh, professionals, we focus more on healing than uh, preventing. Uh, so what are the things to do to, to protect mental health uh, before becoming mentally ill? I was going to ask. Uh, in general, uh, with which self-help methods uh, would you recommend in particular? And what should society level policies be, uh, especially during isolation? Uh, what can we do? And my, the other question is uh, related with uh, pandemics too. Digitalization has increased rapidly uh, during pandemic. And uh, what are the positive and negative effects of this on mental health? Uh, what awaits us? And um, 
through the pandemic, we saw that focusing on spatial groups is better in prevention, especially older than 65. Uh, You're mentioning me. Started, uh, to prevent. <laughs> You have asked very many questions. You've asked many questions. The one which we did earlier was yeah. a general point, a suggestion that as psychiatrists, we should think about primary prevention and that in order to think about primary prevention, we have to create friendships with people who can do it. We can't do it ourselves. Uh, we have to create a friendship with the government in order that they provide iodine because we don't have iodine in our pocket. Mm -hmm. And we should create friendship with teachers in order to stop them from behaving in a manner that is not appropriate, which leads to problems at school. And we should be friends with many other people in the society and try to influence those who are likely, not for ill will, but who are likely by their behavior or in other ways to contribute to the danger, to a risk for mental illness. But that's one answer that concerns the prevention. I think that that uh, is important. Concerning now the use of e-mental health and telepsychiatry, uh, I think probably uh, Dr. Chenan will uh, tell us more about this. Um, it is a, a uh, in many ways, it is a uh, poor replacement of the human contact that you have with the patient. Because the physical presence uh, that is uh, with, in a room when a doctor and the patient are together uh, plays a tremendously important role. Uh, the fact that you put the hand on the shoulder of a person is an enormously reassuring gesture, which you cannot do through the computer. I mean, you can't, you know, I can't put a hand around you uh, because that's just uh, telemental health. So the telemental health caters mainly for a transfer of information. Uh, it brings information to people, uh, while uh, the real treatment was not only bringing over information, but also empathy that is expressed in both physical behavior and in words. And that is the huge difference between the two. So that if you want to spread information rapidly to many people, uh, electronics and the modern possibilities are wonderful. They bring information, but information is never sufficient. Uh, if you want to learn how to be a good doctor, you have to look at the good doctors and see what they are doing. And then you will see things that they have never written down, but they are just doing them and you can look at them and you see that when they say something, the patient is suddenly relieved and, and feels better. All of these things, the behavior which teach which we which we have is of tremendous importance. So I think that uh, in the role of telemental health in uh, uh, in, in uh, pandemics, it's a wonderful medium for transferring information. It is a much less uh, effective medium for, in fact, providing treatment. Now there is one modern uh, sentence which is very important, and that is that. Uh, the treatment of mental illness or the treatment of physical illness is the result of an agreement between a patient and the doctor about the things to do. Now, you can reach these agreements also by telemental health. You can speak to people, but uh, it will take some time before uh, we realize that there is, there are now enthusiasts, enthusiasts for mental health and those who are completely against it. Both are wrong. I think that there is a role for telemental health in terms of transfer of information, advice, but there is a, it's still a necessity uh, if you want to provide treatment to be with the people whom you're treating. It, is un, it cannot be replaced by just simple advice. There are some conditions which, uh, some things which we have not done, and this is our mistake. Um, the, uh, Approximately one quarter to one third of problems that are seen in primary care, that is mental health problem in primary care, could be removed by the people themselves without ever going 
to anybody. If they had been given in school and later on from their parents and in other ways, education about doing things, about various self-help techniques. Uh, one good example of that is the technique of problem solving which is being used and which is a technique which can be used, uh, can be uh, taught to a child of 10 years of age uh, and can be helpful to that child as well to a person of 70. Just a simple sentence or simple instruction, when you have a huge problem, break it apart into small parts and try to deal with one after the other. That's one sentence. You can do this instead of a sentence, you can provide the training in how to solve problems. And that should be a content of training of children in school and subsequently, because so many of the problems that uh, we have can be resolved without asking anybody for advice. But the teaching on how to do this is something that we should certainly introduce. And maybe the transfer of information could help people to learn this and it would be helpful to do it as well. Thank you very much. Many thanks again to both of you. Uh, again, there are uh, several things to underline. Uh, one uh, put something in my mind or uh, made me remember uh, the true way of reaching uh, mental health promotion is through uh, interdisciplinary and intersectoral uh, collaboration. Actually, I should also underline that we in Turkey, as far as I know, had first met the word mental health promotion by uh, Dr. Sartorius in 1987. We were not familiar with that concept. I don't know, maybe it was well known other places, but not uh, in most of, with most of our uh, colleagues. And we are with this uh, association uh, I have been uh, mentioning, which for which we are doing this uh, activity. And also under the Psychiatric Association of Turkey, we have a section uh, focusing on mental health promotion. So uh, we try to underline these issues intersectoral and interdisciplinary uh, collaboration. Thank you for reminding that once more. Can I say a word more Please. about promotion? Please do so. Uh, promotion of mental health or promotion of health can have three meanings. The first meaning of promotion is uh, we will promote mental health in Turkey, which means there will be fewer people with mental illness. We do prevention or we do treatment and then when we have removed the mental disorders, people have better mental health. So that's one understanding of promotion. A second promotion is that we introduce some special techniques which make it possible for people to be more resilient to problems, to be better able to face problems. This is not related to disease. It is increasing their capacity to live a good life to resolve problems more quickly. And then there is a third meaning of promotion. A promotion of mental health may also mean that we are making the mental health more valuable to people than it is now. Uh, there is a scale of values in society. Uh, and you put things on this scale. Something is most important. Something is less important. And at present, mental health is at the bottom of that scale of values. We do not hey, think very much about mental health until we are mentally ill. And I think that the scale, the promotion of health as being of mental health and of health as being of tremendous value and therefore taking precedence over many other things is something that we should keep in mind. It can be done in various ways, but once people think that their health is valuable, they will do things about it. And I think that that is what is important. Give me just one example for that. In Pakistan, we have been trying to convince uh, parents to buy eyeglasses for their children who don't see well. 
some did and some did not. A pair of eyeglasses was, the cost was equal because they were made in a simple way by printing them, was equal to two bottles, two small bottles of Coca-Cola. About 30% of the parents did not buy eyeglasses for their children because they think it is not so very important that they see well. It will get better later. And they are seeing enough, well enough. And even when we told them that good vision is tremendously important for the development of uh, the child and for its health, they are still very reluctant. Now, if you can make it clear to these parents that health is terribly important and the value of health is high, they will buy glasses. They will do things for their health. They will in fact make efforts for their own and for their children's health. So I think that it's important to recognize those three different meanings of promotion. Each one of them requires intersectoral and interdisciplinary collaboration. Thank you very much. Maybe uh, if we have some more time or maybe in another session, we can go into uh, this. Uh, how do we uh, have some ways to increase values. Maybe we can come to that in another session. Since I have got that uh, permission from you that there may be some other meetings, other sessions, let me keep it for that now. Please, Jenan, uh, now let's have you. Thanks again. Uh, I think I have already learned many important things from uh, what Professor Sator said, thank you. And I think it was a great summary of telemedicine, which uh, Dr. Sartorius told us, it's a nice way of spreading information, but uh, it's a poor replacement for therapy. I, I totally agree with that. And I can share something which I experienced during my dissertation. I, I think that in this randomized controlled trials, uh, this aid telemedicine seems uh, more successful than uh, it really is in the reality because I experienced that in my dissertation, the patients had uh, eye contact with me uh, to participate in our study. They came here and uh, saw me. Uh, I told them how uh, they could use our internet-based program, and they uh, also knew that they will see me again. So uh, this was the motivation to use our program. Uh, it's I think it raised the beneficial for them, but in reality, when they don't have any eye contact with a physician or psychiatrist, uh, the motivation will be lower. So uh, I agree that it's a poor replacement, but uh, in this uh, pandemic, I think we were a bit unready to this pandemic as a, as a whole world may be. Uh, some of my colleagues prefer telemedicine because this face masks prevented uh, physician and patient to see each other faces totally. So they said that it's better to see each other online. Their face is fully open, but this time it's uh, technically impossible to have an eye contact because you, uh, you look at the camera or you look at the screen. So it's impossible to take, uh, have an eye contact. So uh, I wonder if uh, Professor Sartorius expects a uh, a permanent change in psychiatric practice, or is there a better way, way to uh, be more ready to if an, another pandemic comes in the future? Can we do any better? Well, uh, telemedicine, like many other things, is an excellent servant, but a very poor master. Uh, it is a servant. If you use it as a tool, it is wonderful. Uh, you. Of course, all tools are dangerous. Knives, for example, are terribly important for our life, but we should use them in the right way. We should use the knives when we have to cut something and not when we want to do something else. If you use a knife in order to play the, the drum, the drum will be broken. So there is no point in using the knife for a drumstick. That is something that you shouldn't be doing. So I think as a tool, telemedicine is immensely useful transfer of information, transfer of patient records, uh, occasional quick advice, advice at a distance, many of these things, it's a wonderful tool. 
but it should not become our master. We should retain the sensible judgment of what is good and bad about it and use it as you use a, a good tool. And I think that then once we do that, uh, of course, we have to now be resistant. Everything that is new goes uh, and is and in particularly uh, male boys and girls, boys and uh, men, they like playing with machines. And there, there is this uh, fantasy and I think the fascination with the machine. So having now a electronic uh, machine, of course, everybody is attracted to use it and that's fine. And they should become masters in it, but they should then think, where do I use it? And where do I not use it? Tomorrow, the COVID will go away. We know that there will be another epidemic after that. There is a, uh, to take just one example, the COVID was probably one of the viruses that we have uh, uh, received from uh, bats. Uh, bats, as you know, live in forests. The forests are being destroyed and bats are moving to towns. And bats have about 40 viruses that are very likely to be offered to humanity very soon. So, and I'm not even mentioning other animals that are forced out of the nature into towns and bring a huge array of zoonosis of all types. So we have many epidemics that will be before us. And I think to know exactly when and how to use telemedicine is extremely useful. And one should keep a, uh, a clear mind uh, where it should be done and where it should not be done. Uh, sometimes a, a telephone call uh, is more useful because it requires less dependence on technology than a Zoom call, which requires some other things. Um, and sometimes uh, probably uh, even speaking through a mask may be a what is So thinking about the right place for telemedicine is a big task and it's now the time to do it and then give it this place. And I, as I say, I think it's of immense value uh, in every, many, many years ago, let me give you an example of another form of telemedicine. We were in Lesotho in South Africa, is a small country called Lesotho. And this Lesotho, uh, at the time, doctors were far away in the uh, uh, province. It's very difficult to, because it's many mountains. So uh, after thinking why these doctors are so unhappy and uh, um, some of them are very, really burned out and depressed, etc. Finally, somebody said, all right, we will do something. Every morning, every Monday morning, the doctors will get an hour, half an hour, in which they can speak to an expert about things that worry them. And so I was present in the room when this was done. These doctors from various parts of Lesotho were calling in and say, I had a case which did not work well. The other one had something else that they had a source of information uh, and they, somebody, a sympathetic person to whom they could speak. And it was a huge effect. They felt much better about themselves. They felt much more useful. And it was a use of a primitive small radio which was at the time used. Now you have these fantastic machines and I think that it's much easier to do this provided it is done uh, with, mesh, with, uh, with a uh, good dose of thinking, how do I make this tool useful? And it's not more than a tool. Thank you. Yes. I think we should consider about uh, more, more about to when to use it and when not to use it. Yes, like you do with any other tool. You will, for certain things, it's best to use it. In other things, it would not be helpful at all to do it. And in some instances, for example, if you are guiding a person who is in fact taking a, a development program and you are occasionally providing him advice, maybe it can replace everything else. But in many of the emotional crises that people have, speaking to a television screen is not the same as crying on somebody's shoulder. Thank you very much. There are lots of things to underline, but I will underline two things. A any tool is either excellent servant or a poor master. Really, it may be a headline. And also another point very important indeed. Uh, unfortunately, humankind has forced 
many things out of nature. Maybe we forced ourselves out of nature. Well, uh, we could go for hours, of course, with this, but uh, with your permission, I will give myself uh, an opportunity to ask something to Dr. Sartorius. Uh, since we are going through such a uh, hard time, uh, many people have lost lots of things. Uh, some of our positions, some of our uh, family members, some of our friends, we tend to have uh, a feeling of despair. Uh, and I would like to ask this, uh, even being a legend like Dr. Sartorius, you may have also faced some frustration, some uh, failures maybe in your life. Uh, what was the best way? Is it, if it is a personal question, please let's leave it aside. But what I wanted to learn from you is uh, what kind of lessons did you have out of your failures? So that that can be a good example for us and for many of our uh, listeners. Well, I think that the, in the final analysis, um, apart from your education in which you learn how to deal with problems, and apart from your uh, uh, physical health, which is very useful and uh, helps you a great deal, I think probably one central uh, uh, support for overcoming problems is having a partner, having a person whom you can trust, with whom you can share things, and with whom you can be. Uh, it is even epidemiologically shown that people who have partners die 10 to 15 years let, plus, uh, uh, later than those who don't. And I think having a partner uh, is an explanation of longevity and of many other things, but it's also one of the key supports that one can have in life. And so if I were to think of where one would most usefully invest it would really be investing into creating friends and broader group of friends, but also a few people with whom you really have a profound and uh, reliable and, and, and relationship of, of trust and, uh, and love, perhaps. Uh, but certainly these uh, ties to another person, in my person, are the number one uh, tool, a number one uh, um, uh, asset that one should have uh, if one wants to survive, overcome difficulties, prolong life, decrease disease, uh, all of the other things. We are not born to be alone. If we are alone and stay alone and don't invest into partnership, um, things will go wrong for most people. Thank you very much. Uh, I understand this is also a way of prevention. I mean, before having a problem uh, which you face, uh, one does not have to think about how to solve it when facing it. But beforehand, uh, in advance, we should have some uh, powerful assets like partners, friends, collaborations. Even we can extend it to interdisciplinary and intersectoral uh, collaborations. Uh, but of course, again, a small parenthesis, uh, sometimes they say the worst message comes from the uh, person or the uh, partner whom you rely on most. Uh, then that's another way to solve that, of course. Well, uh, by and large, I think that uh, it depends on how, how much, you know, partnership and friendships are like flowers. Ah. Unless you add water to them every day, they will fall apart and they will just be there, but they will not be surviving. So I think that partnership requires an investment of your time and your feelings uh, into that, but building relationship with people and building not only relationship with one person, but also with a wider network with whom you are. And that is not coming by themselves. It has to be 
one area in which you will invest time, effort. Sometimes you get very annoyed with your partners or with your friends. Well, that's fine. Okay. That also has to go into it. So it's a major effort, but the payment out of that, the resource that we are getting out of partnership and out of friendships is enormous and makes people live longer, happier, uh, and uh, become more powerful. Great. Uh, I'm afraid to go one more round because time we, we have uh, is coming to an end. But uh, I wouldn't like to stop before asking if there is any last word from uh, my dear friends. Miraj, do you want to add a small thing to make the yeah. best part of this occasion? Yes, I, I, I've, I've learned and gained a lot from this meeting. So again, I, I, I have many uh, thanks to all of you, all of our participants in this meeting. I learned a lot and I, I, my vision is really uh, expand <laughs> with this meeting. So thank you. And thank you be with us, especially for you, Professor Sartorius. It was great to have you in this meeting. Uh, that's all from me. <laughs> I'm really glad to be here. Thank you. So may a small uh, last comment from you? Yes, I want to start with a thank you, of course. It was really, yes, me is right. It was expanding. Um, you gained us perspective. And about the online com um, sessions and uh, treatments, which you do right now, um, there's a lot of studies right now uh, about uh, digital embodiment and digital body. So uh, it is really an area in which I think there will years, uh, there will be years to, to, to read about. So thank you. Thank you, you gain us in some great perspective. Thank you. Uh, yes, Jenon, what would you say if we go in the same order? Last word. Yeah, I would like uh, also thank all our participants and uh, it was very, uh, education, we learned a lot in this meeting. And uh, as Professor Joshkin said there, uh, Dr. Sartorius told us many headline sentences. And may, maybe the, uh, I'm most impressed in the concept that friendship is the best asset and we have to invest it. And I, I have never think, thought that uh, it will be an uh, important tool is say um, make our health better friendship makes our health better uh, i can realize it now better thanks so thank you thank you yes i do care your last words thanks again for uh, being here dear sartorius and uh, all parts participants and there are many underlying as uh, Professor Josh Kuhn and Jenan said. Uh, and uh, the last one is a uh, very um, good finish, and that uh, a partnership or good relations, relationship uh, are like flowers. We have to make water every day. Uh, very nice. I'm in uh, good feelings <laughs> with that sentence and all data you gave us. Thank you very much. But the uh, water should be given in a, in a proper dose, I suppose. Otherwise, <laughs> it will just fall apart. That's also a very good. Uh, depends on the flower. Some want a lot of water and others not so much, yes. Uh, yeah, it depends on the water. Thank you. Yes, uh, dear Dr. Sartoris, please, your last words. And if you want, we can be uh, here for one hour, one more hour to listen to you. But what would No, say? I think it's... it's uh, I do, I enjoy now your questions and I uh, thought that you had done a wonderful job of chairing this session. Uh, I think that the, um, um, if you feel that uh, such a discussion or uh, could be useful to other people and if you want to make it uh, wider, uh, we can certainly uh, find another time to do it. Uh, and I hope that uh, this COVID business will uh, go away and maybe one day we can do it in Kocheli or somewhere else, which would be even nicer. But while this happens, thanks to uh, Chenan and his friends, we have to use the uh, uh, elemental uh, health for ourselves. 
And uh, I hope that we will continue this on another occasion. So thank you very much for the idea, Professor Shoshkun. It was a lovely idea to do it. I enjoy the company and I hope we'll see each other again. Thank you, thank you.